Well, it's really an honor and a privilege to be here and speak with you today. And I want to thank you, Allie, uh, for the invitation as well as Amy. It's really, uh, I was thrilled to get your invitation and to accept it to be here today. Um, you all are doing incredible work growing a more sustainable Wood River Valley. You know, as a community here, we are exploring how we can solve some of the most complex environmental and social challenges that we face. And we continue to be rallied by stories of innovation that are redefining business as usual. And while we've glimpsed at some of the possibilities of building a tomorrow whose success is measured by our resilience in the face of shifting global economies, and while we come from different sectors, finance and business, nonprofit, academia, I think there's much common ground that unites us in this work and provides us an opportunity for transformational change. And I believe that one of the most profound and elemental, elemental areas of common ground is food, as Ali said. Indeed, food connects us like few other things do. It reflects our cultures, our traditions, our values. There are few rituals that we have in our homes or in our communities that don't include food. It's our most profound connection to the earth. Indeed, we are made out of what the earth provides in our food. It nurtures, it sustains, it heals us, and in its lack or excess, food can also create disease. Food is also at the heart of our ability to build a more prosperous, equitable, and secure world. Food has a really outsized environmental, social, political, and economic impact. Um, just just to, f to name a few, uh, you know, how we, how we decide to grow our food and feed ourselves in the future, there are many scientists will say has, will have the greatest impact on what our environment looks like in the future. You know, in the top left here, this is a picture of the northernmost area of the Gulf of Mexico, uh, right where the Mississippi uh, River enters, and the red area is called a dead zone, not enough oxygen in that area to support any life, no fish, no shellfish, and this all uh, is primarily, the, the reason you have that dead zone is from agricultural chemical runoff from uh, all the way from Minnesota down to Louisiana uh, in the, on the Mississippi River. Um, you know, it's a, it gets to be, it blooms to about the size of the state of Massachusetts each summer. I wanted to get a firsthand experience of what that was like. And so I had a friend introduce me to Ray Bradhurst, a third generation shrimper in one of the parishes near New Orleans. And, I was on Ray's boat early one morning before first light. Uh, now, I wasn't just an observer that day. He had the, my, you know, the rubber gloves on up to my elbows, and I was in there harvesting shrimp with his crew. But the first three hours of that morning uh, was sitting in the cabin of the boat, drinking coffee, and heading out to where he could find some shrimp to catch. And uh, I just thought to myself, that's quite a job to make a living having to drive across the state of Massachusetts each day uh, in a boat. And Ray is concerned whether he'll be the last generation of shrimpers. You know, I was, uh, I was really uh, interested and pleased to see, Paul, in your presentation yesterday, how most of the top 10 solutions for climate change are related to food, agriculture, and land use. But it doesn't stop there. Globally, food can spark revolutions. We saw it, the, it was uh, instability of food prices and the ability of entrepreneurs to be involved in the food system that really was the spark that started the Arab Spring. Nationally, food contributes three quarters of a trillion dollars to our U.S. economy. It's a major driver of many state econ economies like Idaho and my home state of Michigan. Locally, it can be an anchor for strong and resilient communities like the Wood River Valley. But you know, at the end of the day, we as humans are like any other species on the planet. We have to feed ourselves to survive, and we have to do it in a way that, that preserves the environment for future generations to feed themselves. And uh, so if we don't get the food system right, I'm not sure anything else we're trying to do is going to matter in the long term. But too often when we have conversations about food, it kind of starts and stops at our plates or maybe our refrigerators. And while those are important, uh, it's important to know that individual actions make a difference. 
difference. What I say is we're never going to eat, shop, or cook our way into a reinvigorated and resilient food system. It's going to take more than individual action. Um, you know, uh, uh, the headquarters of Fair Food Network is Ann Arbor, Michigan. We live very close to Detroit and uh, have a lot of involvement in that community. And in 2009 in Detroit, yeah, you know, when you can imagine the worst economy that that city had seen since the Great Depression, um, a lot of people were asking, what is going to be Detroit's next economy? And we kept saying, why not make Det part of Detroit's next economy, Detroit's first economy, which is the food economy? We have to grab the potential for food as a system to transform our lives, our communities, and our planet. It's not just about realizing its potential, it's really a necessity for our future. And my belief is that the best way we can realize this potential and strengthen local economies in the process is by building resilient and local food systems. You know, a small shift in local food can have a big impact. You're going to hear in a minute from my good friend and colleague, Michael Schumann. Uh, we've known each other for a lot of years, and when we wanted to really take a look at what could be the impact of shifting part of the food system in Detroit to more localization, we asked Michael to come and do a little economic analysis for us. And the modeling he did told us that if we could, just in Detroit, shift so residents and institutions shifted 20% of their food purchasing to local sources, it can generate more than 42,000 new jobs and create about $3 billion in economic benefits annually. In sum, local food grows local economies. Now to bring this home, I want, or to bring it to life, I want to take you on two short field trips this morning. One is to the city of Flint. You know, if I had said uh, a year ago Flint, I would have to say Flint, Michigan. But all I need to do right now is say Flint, and everybody knows what I'm talking about. The story of Flint is complicated, and it's one of failure on multiple levels. It led President Obama to say recently on a visit, a tragedy that should never have happened here in the United States of America the denial of something as basic as clean, safe drinking water. You know, helping that proud city, and I've spent time there, and it is indeed a proud city, proud people, helping that city get back on its feet is requiring an all-hands-on-deck approach with government, nonprofits, philanthropies, all working together, and it doesn't stop at pipes. Indeed, the work ahead is helping to build a community that gets healthy and stays healthy long beyond the current water crisis. And one of the most promising and proven efforts in the community involves not water, but good food, and a program that Fair Food Network started called Double Up Food Bucks. Double Up is what's called a healthy food incentive program. It doubles the value of SNAP, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, used to be called food stamps, doubles SNAP benefits for fresh produce while supporting local farmers. Here's how it works. A family or an individual that has SNAP benefits, used to be called food stamps, goes to a participating farmer's market or grocery store and uh, spends $20 of their SNAP or federal food assistance money on uh, fresh produce at that farmer's market or grocery store, uh, locally grown by farmers. They will get an additional $20 to spend on additional produce. Spend $20, go home with $40 of locally grown produce. The wins are threefold. The families are taking home more healthy food that they need. Farmers are gaining new customers and making more money. And more food dollars are staying in the local economy. Each of these benefits has ripple positive effects across the community. Now, Double Up started in a small pilot in Detroit in 2009, and within the last six years, it's grown to be a statewide success story in close to 200 sites across the state of Michigan, including grocery stores and farmers markets. In fact, today, nearly 90% of the population of the state of Michigan lives in a county where Double Up Food Bucks is available either at a participating farmers market at a grocery store. And this snapshot of the program at Michigan Farmers Market shows its exponential growth. Back in 2007, the total spend, total SNAP spend at farmers markets across the state of Michigan was less than $16,000. By last year, uh, close to $2 million, if we include grocery stores and farmers markets, close to $2 million of SNAP sales distributing products grown in Michigan. 
So low-income shoppers spending their food assistance dollars to support local farmers. This translates into millions of pounds of healthy food purchased and more than eight million SNAP and Double Up sales at participating sites supporting Michigan farmers. And we know that the program works. Close to 90% of the customers who we survey and we do rigorous evaluation tell us they're buying and eating more fruits and vegetables and eating fewer high calorie, low nutrition snacks. Now USDA tells us that each SNAP dollar has about a 1.8 multiplier in the economy. So with Double Up it means a positive potential impact of about $14 million uh, circulating in the local economy because of the program. Now our strong track record in Michigan along with the work of advocates across the country helped inform and inspire bipartisan support for a new $100 million grants program that was established in the 2014 Farm Bill, the large omnibus bill, uh, omnibus bill out of Congress that really is the blueprint for what our food system looks like. This $100 million and brand new program supporting the expansion or scale up of these healthy food incentive uh, projects across the country. With, with the matching requirements of the program, with philanthropy and local sources bringing in an equal amount, this means now $200 million across the country going to scale up this win-win-win uh, this solution. Now if I were to ask you where you think most of the dollars, when President Obama signs the Farm Bill, uh, it's close to a trillion dollar bill. Where do you think most of the dollars in that federal farm bill goes? If I asked you that, what would you say? What would you think? So industrial farms, large corporations. Well, I wanna, I wanna pause to underscore what a game changer a program like Double Up Food Bucks is. Because if you look at the numbers and you do the math, that's how we spend our tax dollars in our food and agriculture system. What, right? Almost 80% of federal food in a farm budget goes to federal food assistance. That's $956 billion over a 10-year farm bill. About $75 billion a year is going to, into the pockets of low-income families to help them uh, spend money on food. What programs like Double Up Food Bucks does is transform SNAP, which is commonly thought of as a hunger and welfare program, into a pro-health and economic development initiative by leveraging those dollars for locally grown fruits and veggies, supporting the local food economy. With Double Up Food Bucks, we use the system to transform the system to serve both vulnerable families and American farmers. We literally are paying the farmer now instead of the doctor later. Double Up is now growing nationwide. We're working with local partners across the country to bring this proven model to their communities. Uh, Double Up Food Bucks programs are now operating in 19 states. And in fact, you can see Double Up, for those of you who are uh, here in Idaho, you can see it active in this state. Some of you may know about the program modeled after Double Up that's here uh, locally. It's been running for a couple of years now under the leadership and initiative of the Local Hunger Coalition. And starting this year, Double Up Food Bucks is spreading across the state of Idaho, uh, working with the Idaho Farmers Market Association. But let me return to Flint for a minute. Double Up has been in Flint since 2011 at the city's farmers market. And we extended it to a couple of local grocery stores. And there are very few local grocery stores in the city of Flint, but the ones that are there now have Double Up Food Bucks. We did this starting last year. And the community's use of the program is one of the strongest in the state. In fact, in 2015, 3,000 shoppers spent more than $100,000 in Double Up Food Bucks at the Flint Farmer's Market, making it the largest single venue for this program anywhere in the state of Michigan. And at the participating grocery store, the landmark stores, where more than 80% of their sales are SNAP sales overall in that grocery store, the store owners had to double the amount of produce they were purchasing just in one year because of this program, much of it coming directly from Michigan farmers. As the health experts explored how best to support Flint children and families that had been exposed to lead in the water for 18 to 24 months, one of the major supports they identified was the need for more foods rich in vitamin C, iron, and calcium. The prescription is more fresh fruits and vegetables. So working with local funders and government agencies, 
we were able to expand the Double Up Food Bucks program in Flint and adapt the program to meet the needs of the community at this time. So starting just last month, Double Up is now in venues all over and around Flint where uh, shoppers get their produce and about 60% of the, of the population of Flint actually uh, is, is our SNAP recipients. The program's now running year round instead of seasonally. Um, because we know these kids need calcium, you earned your Double Up Food Bucks when you buy milk as well as produce. Um, but one of the real innovations that was created, and it's interesting when you start thinking about you know, where you find innovation in the food system. Well, we are finding some innovation in technology in the food system in this situation. Uh, first time in the country, right now in Flint, as of last month, uh, customers or SNAP uh, beneficiaries can receive, sign up and receive a card like this. Double Up Food Bucks card with a magnetic strip on the back. This card allows them to earn Double Up Food Bucks at any location, farmer's market or grocery store, and spend it in any location, farmer's market or grocery store, making it interoperable across the community. We knew we needed to get some new point of sale technology going at the farmer's markets with the farmers and the grocery stores to integrate this. Well, we didn't go to Silicon Valley to look for that technology. We stayed in Flint and we found two brothers, Paul and Eric Knifik, who developed Epic Technology Solutions after growing up in Flint and they developed this technology for us that first time in the country in Flint and we think it has great potential to expand across the country. Another way to invest in the local food economy. So I share this double up uh, food buck story for three reasons. One, it, demonstra it demonstrates what's possible when we put our energy behind multi-win solutions to address very complicated problems like food insecurity and local economic development at the same time. You know, I don't believe we have the luxury of, prob of solving one problem at a time. What we need now are more far-reaching, multi-win solutions that build a healthier tomorrow and make individual problems dissolve. In food systems work, it is especially important to move away from silos and into solutions that support both farmers and consumers. It should never be a question of whether we support hungry families or local farmers. We can do both. We need solutions that deliver access and equity for both farmers and consumers. Second reason, it elevates the important role that public policy can play. Absolutely, investment is important on every level. But with Double Up, public policy was a vehicle that could carry a successful model into the mainstream. And the third reason is that Double Up is right here in the backyard now in Idaho. Its success in Michigan is grounded in partnerships, and the kind of expansion and success we've seen in Michigan can happen in other places as well. So if a program like Double Up can grow demand for healthy uh, locally grown food with this kind of impact, the question really is, are we ready to meet that growing demand? Um, USDA estimates that local food sales totaled about $12 billion in 2014. That was up from $5 billion in 2008, and that value could hit $20 billion by 2019. The grocery industry sees this as one of the uh, fastest growing sectors in their industry. You know, many of us have heard the phrase and used the phrase farm to fork, but we have to consider all the critical businesses that are needed in between. Unfortunately, in too many places in our country, the infrastructure that connects family farmers to the growing demand for what they can produce including companies that aggregate, process, distribute what we eat. They no longer exist. We have what I call a missing middle of our food system. And it's not for lack of energy and entrepreneurship. The food movement is full of passionate individuals who are incubating food businesses. In Idaho, there's an impressive company that actually made some of our breakfast this morning called Idaho's Bounty. It's cultivating the connection between producers and consumers working with more than 85 farmers in the region and supporting consumers and sustainable farm practices. But the critical gap that too often prevents businesses like Idaho Bounty, Idaho's Bounty and others from starting and growing is a lack of access to capital. Across the country, this gap is starting to be filled through new food financing efforts and we're hearing about them on many different scales. I'm gonna talk about one that's at a bit of a smaller scale than what you've been hearing. Our second field trip is, the north, is to the northeastern United States to see a financing project called 
the Fair Food Fund, a project of the Fair Food Network. This fund provides business assistance and financing to what we call good food enterprises. Those businesses and entrepreneurs that are connecting small and mid-sized farms with consumers that are hungry for locally sustainably grown food. Now, by providing both financing and business assistance to these kind of enterprises, the fund is helping entrepreneurs succeed, supporting the viability of small and mid-sized farmers, increasing access to healthy food, and providing a vehicle for funders looking to catalyze change in our food system. Another win-win-win solution, and one that I think fits in some regards with this idea of impact investing. So let me give you just a, one brief example. The Cook family moved to Aroostook County, Maine, one of, the, one of the largest counties in Maine, way north in the state. They moved there 20 years ago. Marada and Leah, the two young daughters there, 20 years ago, they launched, uh, with their uh, father and mom, launched a small successful farm selling potatoes across Maine and extending into Boston markets. Another reason I thought it'd be great to have this example here in Idaho is <laughs> potatoes. But as they grew, they began asking, what can we do with the crops that can't be sold to the fresh market? The potatoes that might be a little misshapen, a little too big or small, a little uglier. Still delicious, but they would basically go into a landfill because they couldn't be sold in the fresh market. So they had an idea. If they could slice, dice, and freeze their extra root crops, they could significantly boost their sale and increase the viability of both their farm and other farms in the area if they could also buy those seconds that get plowed under or put in the dump from other farmers. So in 2011, Leah and Murata, now mature businesswomen, along with another business partner, launched the company Northern Girl to bring this idea to life. They had, early, they had a great early success, but quickly needed to scale their production to keep growing and it required moving into a new facility and getting new equipment, all of which required capital. So uh, back in August of 2014, Fair Food Fund closed on a loan to Northern Girl to purchase equipment to increase their production of potato wedges and salad bar beets. And with this equipment in place and in this new facility, Northern Girl doubled its sales in one year compared to the previous year, expanding now to whole food markets in the region, and most of the farm to school um, products that are going to schools throughout Maine now are coming from Northern Girl and from the farmers in Northern Maine. Again, this has far-reaching ripple effects, uh, spurring job creation in rural Maine, providing additional revenue for area farmers, and increasing consumer access to locally produced food. Uh, the Fair Food Fund is bolstered by providing business assistance both one-on-one -on -one consulting as well as an annual business boot camp for selected entrepreneurs. For Northern Girl, for example, before the loan, we provided them cash flow planning support, and after the loan, we provided them uh, funds to do better safety certification. And this kind of support is critical. You know, uh, something Ali didn't mention, but when I was a very young man, uh, during most of my 20s, I started and uh, was running an alfalfa sprout business. I'm from Northern California, so this, I was one of the first alfalfa sprout growers in California and probably in the country. Uh, I was long on passion and ideas and pretty short on business skills. And as we've created the Fair Food Fund, I thought, boy, wouldn't it be great if I had had access to the kind of, those kind of resources when uh, my sprout business was getting off the ground. Business assistance can help turn entrepreneurs' potential into profit. So separately, our two signature efforts at Fair Food Network, the Fair Food Fund and Double Up Food Bucks, demonstrate a systems approach to, changing, to change that creates multiple wins simultaneously. Together, they work in tandem to reimagine our food system by both growing demand and building supply for healthy, locally grown food. The fund is also designed ultimately to be profitable over the long term. So the idea here, the, the Fair Food Fund is actually a nonprofit fund, so the idea here is that it's like a social enterprise of Fair Food Network. As we earn money in the marketplace supporting businesses that are in alignment with our mission, that the money we earn can go back to feed the nonprofit efforts uh, that we're undertaking, like Double Up Food Bucks, which was never designed to make a profit. I hope these two field trips 
spark ideas of your own and spur us all into, into more action. We have a lot of work to do and I believe we're ready for it in this food movement. There's more energy, interest, and innovative models in this good food movement today than I've experienced in my 40 years of work as a farmer, as businessman, an academic, a philanthropist, and an advocate. The big question is how do we take these pockets of innovation and scale them more broadly? How do we ensure that they're not just isolated victories, but big wins that influence the system as a whole? And how do we build the political will so we can move this work forward faster? Well, I believe the answer lies in expanding who we work with to drive the change we need. You know, it's always more comfortable for us to work with people whose uh, ideas and values overlap ours completely. But if we're not more inclusive, we won't see the change we need in the time frame that we need it. We need to find unlikely partners if we're going to have an in, a significant impact on issues like global warming, our health crisis, income inequality, and the nutritional divide. We need to increase the diversity of people and ideas at the table. We need to find we need to focus on finding and implementing workable ideas rather than on staking ideological ground. The more we act as if there are enemies to conquer, the more our energies are diverted into unwinnable fights. We have to engage partners at every level in designing systems that work for them as well as for us. If potential partners aren't yet aligned, we can't shun them. Instead, we need to bring them along meet on common ground and help build a closer relationship. That's how you make change to whole systems. Now not everyone is going to be an active participant, but you know what? We don't need everyone. The Civil Rights Movement didn't need everyone on its side to demolish Jim Crow, and when I think about how the strides that the LGBT community made for marriage equality over the last decade and how that re resulted uh, in the Supreme Court decision last just a year ago. Um, this all happened without the entire country at its side, believe me, uh, but it happened. We need just enough people who understand that food is a system that affects not just our meals, but our communities, our state, our country, and our planet. So that is what makes gatherings like this one so important. They provide us with the opportunity to meet each other, to make new connections, and test the boundaries of our current thinking. Now is not a time to shy away from the challenges ahead. It's the time to determine what each of us can do to be bold with new ideas. Now, I know there are some of us sitting here today whose passion and capacity are to start something new. And there are others of us who are drawn to supporting the good work that others might be doing. When it comes to food, we can all do something in our homes, in our work, in our schools, in our places of worship. My hope is that the spark of passion that lies in each of us will be fueled by this time together and help each of us take meaningful steps toward creating a more healthy and resilient food system. So once again, I thank you for the opportunity to be here with you today. It's been my pleasure. And, and just, just one more thing before I end, Allie had mentioned a book that I wrote. Uh, the book is out here and um, I am instituting a special today called Double Up Book Bucks. <laughs> because I didn't, know that, I didn't know that Allie and her team had actually ordered books from an independent bookseller. They did and so, right, and I think that's great to do. So uh, anybody, uh, I'll be here for about an hour after this session ends, and anybody who buys a book from that independent bookseller is going to get a book from me signed at no charge for you to give to somebody else. So double up book bucks. <laughs> <laughs>